Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today about COVID-19 RNA vaccines. I'm Alex Danis here with Mini PCR Bio, and we're really excited to talk through the science of these vaccines that many of us are hearing about a lot on the news right now, and some people have actually started to receive, which is really exciting. So I want to first say hello to Sebastian and Bruce and Allie in the chat. They're going to be joining me here uh, today, and they're going to be helping to answer some questions as we go through this and actually talk a bit uh, with you as we're going through all of these slides. So what we're going to be talking about today uh, are COVID-19 RNA vaccines. I'm going to be walking through a webinar, and I want to point out for students and teachers that if you click the link in the description below, there is actually a worksheet with questions that you can follow along with today uh, if you want to go through it with us and answer some questions about these RNA vaccines and the science behind them. And I do want to point out that at Mini-PCR Bio, we're a group of scientists and educators, and our main focus is genetics and biology and sort of biotechnology. So we're going to be focusing today on the science behind these vaccines rather than sort of the public health uh, and epidemiology aspects. And we're also really excited to be sharing what we know about the science behind these vaccines with you to try and help get more information about them out there into the world. But I do want to also note that we are not vaccine creators ourselves. We're not associated with any of these vaccine companies. We're just trying to get, uh, trying to use our expertise to help share information about them because they're a new and exciting method of trying to fight disease. Oops. So. Getting started today, we're going to talk through a number of different things. So first, we're going to be talking about SARS-CoV-2, what it is, uh, and how we're going to try and actually fight it with vaccines. We're going to talk a lot about the science behind RNA vaccines, what they are, and how they work. We're also going to talk a bit about how our immune system responds to those vaccines, so how they work together to be able to fight uh, this virus. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how they're made. We're also at the end going to answer some of those questions that so many of you sent in. You did an awesome job asking great questions about these vaccines. So we're going to try and answer as many of them as possible as I both go through the webinar and at the end uh, in that Q&A section. So stick around for that at the end. So first of all, we're going to start with the basic biology of what is a virus. We're going to be talking all about viruses today. And viruses really have two main components. So they have some sort of DNA or RNA genome. So this is all of the genetic material, all of the instructions for making more virus. And then they're enclosed in some sort of shell. And depending on the virus, this shell can be kind of different. But those are really the two main parts of the virus are the genetic material for that virus and then a shell that will surround that genetic material. And there are lots of different viruses in the world that infect a whole range of different hosts. There are viruses that infect bacteria, viruses that infect animals, some that infect plants, and then of course some that infect uh, ourselves, we're animals, but there are some that infect humans as well. And of course the virus that we're really going to be focused in on today is SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. So I'm going to try and be really careful about using those two distinct words today. COVID-19 is the name of the disease and SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus that causes it. And that two at the end of SARS-CoV-2 is because this virus looks a lot like a virus that scientists had encountered back in about 2003, 2004, which uh, was what we originally just called the SARS virus, SARS-CoV-1. So this is a very similar virus, and both of these viruses are coronaviruses. And they're caused that because of these spike proteins that you can see on the outside of this coronavirus, these little spiky bits, they make the virus look a little bit like a crown or a corona, or it looks like it has a crown around it. So SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus, and it's an RNA virus. So all of its genetic material is stored in RNA. And you can see here in this uh, picture that that RNA is surrounded by a protein. This is a nucleocapsid protein to try and keep it safe. And then it has this outer uh, glycoprotein membrane, which is the part that's actually broken down when you wash your hands with soap and water, which is one of the great reasons why washing your hands is one way to fight uh, COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, because it will break down that outer membrane. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and yes, as Bruce mentioned, it's wonderful to see so many students here. I'm really excited that so many classrooms are joining us today. <clears throat> So I want to talk first about the viral replication cycle and how SARS-CoV-2 actually replicates when it <clears throat> infects our own host cells. Excuse me. So when SARS-CoV-2 encounters our cells, 
it will actually bind to them via a receptor on the outside of the cell membrane. So this is uh, a receptor that is actually not specifically for that virus. It's a receptor that our cells use for other jobs, but the virus has evolved to be able to latch onto that receptor, which will then allow it to move inside the cell. And once that virus is inside the cell, it's gonna shed its outer, uh, it, once it's in the cell, it's going to shed its shell, and that viral genome is what's gonna be left behind. And the virus is actually going to uh, use the cell's own machinery, including ribosomes and a number of different enzymes, to both make copies of its genome and of those outer shell proteins. So the virus can't replicate on its own. It has to use the cell's machinery to replicate and create, again, its two parts, the, uh, that inner RNA genome and its outer shell proteins. And once it uses uh, that host cell to make these two parts, those are going to assemble, and then those newly assembled and replicated viruses will be able to go out into uh, the rest of your body and infect other cells. Now, once this happens, your body will actually develop antibodies or will hopefully develop antibodies against it. It will learn what that virus looks like, and if you get infected with it again, it will be able to fight it off. However, through the long history of science and medicine and trying to fight things like viruses and bacteria and different pathogens, we tried to come up with ways to give your body uh, a chance to create those antibodies and create that immune response without having to actually get infected by the virus. And this is where vaccines come from. Now, if you want to do a deep dive on vaccines, we have a webinar from a couple months ago now, really diving through the history of traditional vaccines and how they were developed and where they came from. And so there is a live webinar of that uh, on our website under educational resources, as well as PowerPoint slides and questions and worksheets to go along with that too. And I'll link to all of those at the end. So First of all, uh, but just for today, I want to talk about what is a vaccine uh, very, very briefly. So the idea, again, as I mentioned, is that we want to introduce your immune system to some portion of a pathogen, so some portion of a virus or some portion of a bacteria, to be able to give your body and your immune system a chance to learn what it looks like and learn how to fight it before you actually get that infection. So traditionally, we've done this by introducing some portion of a weakened or dead virus or bacteria into your body to teach your immune system what it looks like and then allow it to create antibodies against it. And this way, if you actually get that infection in the future, your body will be able to fight it. So this is traditionally how vaccines have worked uh, and what we've done uh, to create them. So we're developing many different kinds of vaccines against COVID-19. So some of these are using traditional strategies like dead or weakened viruses, but to fight this pandemic, we're going to need a lot of different types of vaccines that work in lots of different scenarios. So some of uh, some companies are developing traditional vaccines, but we're also using lots of new strategies, including things like DNA and RNA vaccines. And that's really what we're going to focus in on today are how these vaccines are different from traditional vaccines and the benefits that they might have moving forwards. So RNA vaccines, kind of like viruses, have two main parts. So they have an interior piece of RNA that's going to actually do the work in your cell. And then they have a lipid nanoparticle bubble around them. So nanoparticle just means small. Lipid is fatty. So this is a little fatty bubble that's going to surround that RNA and help it get into your cells. So when we combine these two parts, I want to walk through how they actually work when that uh, vaccine gets actually into your cells. So the RNA vaccines that uh, we're going to be talking about today are intramuscular injections. So they're a shot that is injected into uh, usually your upper arm or your muscle. And so that's going to introduce the vaccine into your muscle. And then those little lipid nanoparticle bubbles, which contain the RNA, are going to be introduced into your cells. And when that happens, the RNA inside of them is going to enter the cytoplasm of your cells. And then again, your own cells ribosomes. So these are the uh, protein production uh, machinery in your cells that turn RNA into protein. They're going to use the instructions in that RNA from the vaccine to create a single protein from SARS-CoV-2. So this is the spike protein. We're gonna talk a little bit more about it in the next slide, but that RNA is going to give your cell instructions to make only that spike protein. Your body is going to use, that, uh, use those instructions, make that spike protein, and then present it to your immune system. 
and your immune system will create antibodies against that spike protein. And then if in the future you get infected by SARS-CoV-2, your body will already have these antibodies produced. Your body will already know what that spike protein looks like and it'll know how to fight it so that your body will already be ready to fight SARS-CoV-2, to fight off that virus without having to get infected by it. So why did scientists choose the spike protein? So again, this uh, RNA vaccine contains the genetic information to create only one protein from SARS-CoV-2, and it's that spike protein. It's that big spiky protein on the outside that makes it uh, a coronavirus and makes it look like it's got a little crown on it. And the uh, reason for this is that, again, as I mentioned, SARS-CoV-2 is related to viruses we've seen before, including SARS-CoV-1 and the MERS virus, uh, the, which was from about 10 years ago. So we've seen similar coronaviruses in the past, and there's been lots of research done on these coronaviruses, thinking about creating vaccines against them. And what scientists have seen in the past in animal studies is that the animals developed the best immune response against this virus when the vaccine introduced them to the spike protein versus other proteins from this virus. So we already had a great uh, body of research done on these other coronaviruses that indicated that the spike protein was gonna be a good vaccine candidate. So very briefly, I just wanna look at the genome of SARS-CoV-2 to show you the piece of the genome that encodes for the spike protein. Because as I mentioned, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. All of its uh, genetic information, all of the instructions for making that virus are stored in RNA. And if we look at this uh, genome here, this is the full genome up top, and down at the bottom, it's describing all of the different pieces in it. There's only one short piece of it that, that codes for that spike protein. And so this is the only piece of RNA from the genome that is gonna be introduced uh, by that vaccine into your cells. And so this is important because it's the only part that uh, we want to create of that virus. It's the only part that you're gonna create antibodies against. And what it means is that your body does not have the full instructions to create uh, the full virus. So that was a question we got a lot is, is it possible to get COVID-19 from these RNA vaccines? And the answer is no, because we're only introducing one short piece of RNA that encodes for one piece of that virus, rather than the genetic information for creating the whole virus. So it's like giving you just one recipe from a really big recipe book. You couldn't build the whole recipe book from just that one recipe. So you cannot get COVID-19 from these RNA vaccines. So when uh, this vaccine is introduced into your body and into your immune system, uh, a couple of things happen. So as I mentioned, the immune system remembers what that spike protein looks like using antibodies and memory cells. And again, in the vaccine webinar that we did a couple months ago, we dive a little bit deeper into the actual immune response in these different types of cells. But the main point here is that your body is going to learn what this virus looks like and then be able to remember that into the future using antibodies and memory cells. The other thing, and again, something that we've gotten questions on, is that your body is actually really good at recognizing foreign, foreign RNA. So your body doesn't uh, has a pretty good antiviral system, and so when it sees something that looks like RNA that isn't from your body, it's really good at chopping it up and trying to get rid of it. So your body already recognizes that there's something different happening here from that RNA, and so it starts to ramp up an immune system in response to uh, that vaccine. So this is sometimes referred to as the innate immune response. And again, we go into more details in that in the vaccine webinar. But the idea is that sometimes people have heard of things called adjuvants, which are additional molecules that are added to vaccines to stimulate the immune system and really sort of ramp it up so that uh, it's encouraging your immune system to create antibodies and really to create the strong immune response against the vaccine. And one of the really interesting things about these RNA vaccines is that your body seems to do that in response to just the RNA and the lipid nanoparticles. So there's no need to add these additional adjuvanting molecules to get that immune response. So why use RNA vaccines? So RNA vaccines are sort of a new methodology in vaccines that we're just starting um, now to deliver to humans in these first two approved vaccines. So why are we using this new technology? What are the advantages of doing this in a new way? 
So one of the advantages is that they're pretty easy to manufacture. And we're going to be going through some of the steps of that a little bit later in the presentation. But the idea is that you really just need to create this RNA. You don't need to uh, grow virus for traditional viruses that have dead or weakened viruses. So you're not working with the actual virus itself. You're not working with the infectious uh, viral particle. You don't need to grow lots of it. Some uh, vaccines that we think of, like the flu vaccine, you actually grow a lot of the flu virus in eggs. So just normal chicken eggs. So you can imagine that that takes a lot of time. So we don't don't need to grow virus in anything like eggs or cell culture. All we need to do is to create this RNA, and they're potentially really inexpensive because of this. So at the moment, they're a little bit more expensive because they're new. We're sort of getting the production ramped up for them. But in the future, uh, if we create more RNA vaccines, the actual components are pretty cheap, so it'll be cheaper to create vaccines moving forwards. However, RNA is not super stable. So if you just inject uh, sort of RNA on its own into your body, again, as I mentioned, your body's really good at breaking down RNA. So we need to use these lipid nanoparticles to actually get it into your cells and into your body. And it's also not super temperature stable. So this is something that you've probably been hearing about a bit on the news, that these RNA vaccines need to be kept really cold. So this is because, uh, first of all, there are enzymes called RNases. So these are enzymes that uh, are ready to chop up any RNA they see. They're in us, they're on our skin, they're sort of everywhere in the environment. So uh, at lower temperatures, these RNases are less active, so they're less likely to chop up the RNA in the vaccine. And also uh, at warmer temperatures, even just water can attack the nucleic acid backbone of the RNA and through hydrolysis start to break it down. And I don't want to dive into the chemistry of that, but the idea is that the RNA can break down easily at warmer temperatures, so it needs to be kept cold. So this is a disadvantage to these vaccines because it needs a specific cold chain to move it from manufacturing to actually the place where it's going to be delivered and it needs to be kept really cold along the way. Another thing I want to talk about here with these RNA vaccines is that they're really not a new idea. So we've been studying RNA technology and uh, the idea of RNA vaccines since the early 90s. And so there have been uh, clinical trials and preclinical trials that have looked at using RNA vaccines against a number of different viruses. So these include things like Ebola and influenza and Zika virus. So there's been a lot of work put into these RNA vaccines. And because of that, at the beginning of 2020, when SARS-CoV-2 really started to come about, this is, uh, we were sort of really just poised now to be able to actually create and deliver these RNA vaccines because of a number of different sort of technological advances. So this is a very complicated timeline. I don't want you to get bogged down in all of the details here, but the point is that we've been working on all the different parts of this and they've all just started to come together. So again, as I mentioned, one of the big, uh, limiting factors on these RNA vaccines in being able to actually get them to people and produce them and get them to work is that your body really just wants to chop up foreign RNA. It doesn't want it to be in there. So there were a number of different advances made over the years on how to make those RNA molecules a bit more stable. So that was one thing that scientists have been working on for many years is to increase the stability of those RNA molecules. Additionally, um, there have been advances in these lipid nanoparticles that allow us to actually deliver the RNA molecules. There's been lots of work done on that over the past decade or so, and really we're just getting at the point now where uh, you know, we've got that part of the equation as well. There's also been all of this research that was done on related viruses like SARS-CoV-1 and the MERS virus. So that research has all been progressing over the past uh, couple of decades. And additionally, uh, there's been great work done on uh, RNA uh, therapeutics and RNA uh, pharmaceuticals that aren't vaccines over the past few years, uh, in past few decades, actually. So in 2004, one of the first sort of RNA therapeutic molecules uh, was used against macular degeneration, which is an eye disease. So that was back in 2004, where we started delivering these RNA molecules for things uh, like macular degeneration. And we started to use them in more and more cases and more and more clinical trials over the years. So over the past couple of years, RNA vaccines have actually been tried uh, against cancer as well. And that's another area where they're making great strides. So all of this is to say that while these RNA vaccines are the first ones that we're using in humans, they're not a new idea and they're really the culmination of decades of work across many different fields that are all coming together right now. 
And again, one of the reasons why they were all able to come together right now and to really move forward uh, sort of quickly and bring all these pieces together is because of the huge amount of resources and time and just researchers that all turned uh, to fight against COVID-19 all at the same time at the beginning of 2020. So it was really sort of a culmination of all of these efforts coming together to create these vaccines and amazing collaboration between groups. Oh, I'm echoing. I'm so sorry. Uh, I don't know how long I've been echoing. Perhaps this will fix it. Um, perhaps there's a little less echo. Maybe. Well, I'm going to proceed in the hopes that there is less echo and you guys can tell me if that is incorrect. Okay, I'm good now. Awesome. So there are two RNA vaccines that have been approved for use here in the United States, and I believe now in uh, the UK as well. So these are two that you might have heard of uh, referred to as the Moderna vaccine and then the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccines. So they're made by two different companies, but the RNA in each of them codes for an almost identical spike protein. So really they're slightly different because of the lipid nanoparticles that surround them, the uh, sort of proprietary molecules that help them get into your cells. Um, and that actually is what results in those slightly different storage temperatures that the two have. But I do wanna walk through the ingredients for each to show you just how similar they are. So, so these are the two ingredient lists for the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. And this looks like a lot of words, but what it really is, if we look at it, is each one contains mRNA. So this is the mRNA. These are the instructions for your body for that spike protein. Then they each have a number of different lipids involved uh, in them, in that lipid nanoparticle shell. So they're slightly different between the two companies, but they work in very similar ways. These are the lipid nanoparticles that are going to help uh, this RNA get into your cells. And then each of them also contains a small amount of salts. These are just going to help keep the pH of that vaccine at an appropriate level. It's going to help uh, to keep everything stable in that vaccine. And then the final ingredient in each is sucrose or sugar, and this is going to help with the stability. So really, each of these vaccines has four main types of components. It has the RNA, it has the lipid sort of fatty nanoparticle bubble that's going to help that RNA get into your cells, and then it has some salts and sugar just to keep everything stable and to try and keep it uh, pH happy. So because each of them has almost identical RNA, I want to talk a little bit about what that RNA looks like and what it codes for. And I want to start by doing that by looking at the anatomy of a eukaryotic RNA molecule. So this is what our own RNA looks like. And the whole idea here is that over time, viral uh, viruses have uh, evolved their RNA to look like our RNA so that when they infect us, um, our bodies will recognize it and uh, our ribosomes will turn them into protein and actually copy them. So our RNA or our own eukaryotic RNA looks like this. These are sort of the main components where we have a central protein coding region. This is what is gonna have the instructions to tell your body how to make a certain protein when that RNA is translated into protein. There are two UTRs or untranslated regions on the ends of that protein coding region. So the five prime UTR and the three prime UTR. And these just sort of give uh, your body and your cells additional information about what to do with that RNA. So they you know, can give some information about how much of that RNA to turn into protein. There's also a cap at sort of the front, the five prime end that helps to prevent degradation in the cell. And then there's also a poly A tail. So when we think of RNA, it's composed of four nucleotide bases, A, T, C, and G. And the order of those four nucleotide bases is what tells uh, your body how to make and it tells your body and your cells how to make all of those different proteins. So by arranging those four bases, you can get all of the different proteins that you need. And at the end of uh, euk eukaryotic messenger RNA, there's this long poly A tail, which helps uh, to work as a cap as well and to prevent degradation. And again, it has some roles in controlling how much of that RNA is turned into protein. So these are the main structural components of uh, eukaryotic RNA. And again, as I mentioned, viral RNA has sort of evolved over the years to look a bit like this, to trick your body into uh, making those viral proteins that it needs to replicate and make more virus. So vaccine makers sort of took a page out of the virus's book 
and they made their own uh, RNA in the vaccines look again like a eukaryotic RNA. So you're going to uh, notice a lot of the same features in this. So this is uh, a schematic of the RNA in the organization. And what you can see is in the middle, there is a protein coding region. So this is the region of RNA that is going to give your cells the information it needs to turn the RNA into the, or to use the code in the RNA to create the spike protein. Then there are two untranslated regions or UTRs. Again, these are going to give your cells more information on how much of that uh, protein to create from the RNA. There's also a cap at the beginning and a poly A tail at the end, because again, as I mentioned, your body really wants to degrade RNA. RNA is pretty transient in your cells. It doesn't stick around forever. Once your cell is done with it, it'll degrade it. So these are there again to make it look uh, a bit like RNA that your cell is gonna wanna turn into a protein and also to keep it around for uh, a little bit longer so that it can actually create that protein. And then there's also a little signal uh, region in here that's just gonna help direct uh, the growing protein to where it needs to go in the cell. So these are the components of the RNA in that vaccine. It's really the instructions that your body needs to create just that spike protein so that it can display that spike protein to your immune system and create antibodies against it. Now, if we look at the actual code of that vaccine, Lots of letters here. We're certainly not going to go through all of it, but this is the actual RNA code in that schematic. And so what you'll notice here is that it looks a little different from what we might expect. Uh, as I mentioned, and yes, somebody just called me out in the comments for RNA. It's A U C and G, not A T C and G. I say A T C and G far too much. Uh, so the nucleotides in RNA are A U C and G. Excuse my verbal typo. Um, so yes, I didn't speak. I'm so sorry. A, U, C, and G. But if we notice here, what we see is A, C, G, and something that looks like a little trident. So that trident, uh, that weird looking base pair is called a pseudo uh, uridine or a pseudo, uh, the technical term here is 1-methyl-3 pseudo uridyl, which is a little hard to pronounce. But what it is, is it is a slightly modified version of a U. So rather than A, U, C, and G, we use A, C, and G, and this. And what it does is it, again, it helps to prevent your body from just immediately breaking down that RNA when it's introduced. So uh, again, your body wants to chop up any RNA that doesn't look like it belongs there. So this helps uh, to prevent that degradation but it's read just like a uracil or a U would be. So your body is going to read that base pair just like it would. And while it looks a little different, our body actually uses a lot of different modified uh, base pairs in it. Uh, and we don't need to go into base pair modification right now. But while it looks a little different, your body will be able to recognize it. Uh, they're naturally found in our own RNA, and your body will know what to do with it and how to break it down afterwards. But it just helps to keep that RNA in the vaccine a little bit stable. And this is one of the sort of big, amazing breakthroughs that has made RNA vaccines possible are these modified base pairs. So we've talked a bit about the science of RNA vaccines, but do they work? Uh, and the answer so far from the clinical trials, especially the phase three clinical trials that we have right now, is yes. And so we're going to walk through two graphs that look very similar. Um, so this is some of the clinical trial data from the Pfizer vaccine. And so this is all very small, but what I want you to know here is that on the x-axis, we have days since vaccination. And on the y-axis, we have accumulation of COVID cases. And in blue here, we have cases that happened in the population that received the vaccine. And in red, we have cases that happened in the population that received a placebo. And so in both of these trials, in the Pfizer and Moderna trials, about 15 to 20,000 people were in the two separate groups. And uh, one of these 15 to 20,000 person groups received the vaccine, which had that RNA, and the other group received a placebo, which was basically just a saline solution or salt water. And so what you can see here is that in this blue line, so this is the number of cases that accumulated in those 15 to 20,000 people who got the vaccine, that blue line is a lot lower and there are a lot fewer cases in the vaccine group than there are in the placebo group. And the, that, that was the Pfizer data. And this is the same thing in a slightly prettier graph from the Moderna group, 
where again, uh, we're looking at days since vaccination versus number of COVID cases. And you can see that COVID cases accumulated much faster in the placebo group than in the vaccinated group. And you can also look at that down here, sort of the, in the actual quantifications. So there were 14,000 people who received the vaccine, uh, or a little over 14,000 people, a little over 14,000 people who received the placebo, and only 11 people who received the vaccine actually got COVID, and 185 people who received the placebo got COVID. And I think, too, it's important to look at these two groups that while some people who received the vaccine did get COVID, none of them had severe COVID cases, while there were severe COVID cases in the placebo group. So not only is the vaccine preventing against COVID, it also seems to be preventative against severe COVID, which is typically the type that puts you in the hospital and has really poor outcomes. So this is really great that these, uh, we now have data that these vaccines work. It's very encouraging. Um, and so we have these two that have been approved for use, uh, emergency use in the US and the UK. And I know I have started to get vaccine selfies from friends. Um, and so more and more people are getting vaccinated as we speak. Now, as I mentioned before, one of the uh, really potentially great things about RNA vaccines is that they can be produced uh, ideally at very low cost. We don't need to use anything like eggs or cell culture to grow a lot of them. And the production is really fast. And that's because it's using something called in vitro transcription. So rather than having to work with the virus itself and grow lots of the virus or to actually grow parts of the virus. So some vaccines uh, that are in clinical trials right now, instead of giving you the RNA to make the protein, they just give you the protein. They give you that spike protein in the vaccine itself. And these can be great and really effective, but it's that added work of actually making that protein in the lab to be able to deliver it to someone. So instead, RNA vaccines are, are created using a technique called in vitro transcription. So the idea is that you have a uh, piece of DNA that has um, uh, here in purple, that region that is going to actually be uh, transcribed into RNA. So you have DNA that has the sequence for the vaccine that you want to make, and you can put that into E. coli. And E. coli is really great at making lots and lots of copies of DNA. So the E. coli is going to make you lots and lots of copies of that DNA. Then you can break apart the E. coli, you can take out all of that uh, DNA, and you can put it into an in vitro transcription system. So what this is, is it's basically uh, mimicking the transcription process that would happen in a cell in a tube. So you have your DNA and you add to it all of the enzymes and nucleotides that you need to turn DNA or to transcribe DNA into RNA. And you put all of those pieces in there without having to use living cells and create lots and lots of RNA. And that is the RNA that's actually gonna be packaged into those lipid nanoparticles and then introduced uh, as the vaccine. So this is really fast, it's effective. You don't have to work with uh, any living cells. And one of the important parts is that if you need to update the vaccine, if you need to make changes to the vaccine, all you need to do is change that original uh, DNA cassette, which is very easy to do um, and very fast to do in the lab. So rather than having to grow new proteins or uh, work with new strains of viruses, all you have to do is make a little update to your DNA and then make more of that RNA. And again, it's uh, a much faster and a much lower cost system moving forward. So uh, if that's a system that you would like to model in your classroom, I do just want to mention that we have our own in vitro transcription system called BioBits. Um, so it works using a uh, sort of prokaryotic system. So it's a little bit different than what they're using to make the vaccine. But the idea is very similar, where you can actually look at transcription and translation in real time in the lab by introducing um, some DNA into the BioBits uh, product, which has, again, all of the different things you need for transcription and translation, but without the living cells. So you've basically broken apart a bunch of bacteria, taken all the machinery out of it, and put it into um, a tube so that what you can do is you can add DNA, and then you can watch as that DNA is transcribed into RNA and then translated into protein because of some cool fluorescent tricks uh, that we've used where when you create RNA, your tube will glow green, and you're actually, when that RNA is transcribed, or translated into protein, you're going to create a red fluorescent protein so your tube will glow red. So you can actually watch transcription and translation happen in real time using a very similar system. So if you want in your classroom to model how these vaccines are made, this is a really similar way to do that. 
So I'm going to get to the Q&A section in just a minute. And so there are a lot of questions that are coming in in the chat. And we had a lot of questions that came in before. But before we get to all of those, uh, and thank you again to Sebastian and Allie and Bruce, who seem to be doing a lot of great answering in the chat uh, as I talk through this, I do want to sort of do a wrap up of where we are. So RNA vaccines and the uh, methods behind them have been in development for decades. And we're finally at a point where we're able to take all these pieces and bring them together to create vaccines that are already starting to help fight COVID-19. And there are two of those that have both been shown to be about 95% effective in preventing COVID-19 that are approved for use in the U.S. and now in the U.K. Uh, and one of the really nice things is that this type of platform could be really useful moving forward for not just COVID-19, but now that we have, again, growing data about these RNA vaccines and we're sort of scaling up the production of them, we can use this for fighting other types of viruses and pathogens in the future, which is really encouraging. So... Now I want to dive a little bit into the Q&A section. And so this is a question that we got a lot is, do these RNA vaccines change our DNA? And as I think has maybe been discussed in the chat, and hopefully you've been able to glean from uh, what we've done so far in this presentation, the answer is no. So the RNA in these vaccines does not enter the nucleus where your DNA is, and it doesn't interact with your DNA in any way. And as I've mentioned, one of the actual uh, difficulties in creating these RNA vaccines is just getting the RNA to stick around long enough to do its job because your body really wants to destroy it. So the RNA is going to be degraded really quickly after it's turned into a protein. It doesn't enter the nucleus. It doesn't go anywhere near your DNA. And again, I think that's really, uh, again, sort of easy to see here in this schematic where the vaccine delivers that RNA into the cytoplasm of your cells and all of the work of your ribosomes turning that into protein happens out in the cytoplasm. It does not happen in the nucleus, um, and then you'll create antibodies against it. None of that work happens in the nucleus. It all happens out in the cytoplasm far away from your own DNA. So these vaccines do not uh, impact your own DNA in any way. The RNA will be broken down really quickly, so it's not just going to exist in your body forever. And the other thing that I want to mention is, remember, you know, it's being injected into your arm. It's going to affect some of the muscles, uh, some of the cells in your arm, but it's not infecting every cell in your body. This vaccine is only being introduced into a small cell population, and it's not going to change your DNA. Another question that we got a lot of and that I've seen popping up uh, sort of across the internet right now is, will... Uh, will these two vaccines that are approved right now be effective against new viral variants and how easy will it be to update these vaccines? So I want to talk first about what viral variants are. And so we've been hearing a lot about them in the news. And the idea is that as viruses spread through a population, they accumulate small genetic changes or variants. And this is something very well known about viruses. Scientists have been well aware of this and have uh, been anticipating that this would happen as we've watched uh, SARS-CoV-2 move through the population. And so now what we're seeing is that some uh, variants of the virus have developed small mutations or small changes in the gene that encodes for the spike protein. So there is a possibility that if the virus out spreading in the population accumulates enough mutations in the spike protein that that spike protein no longer looks like the spike protein in the vaccine, that the antibodies that your body made against the vaccine might not recognize that new spike protein out there in the population. However, it is very likely at the moment, um, and there have even been lab results that came out at the very end of the last week that suggest that this is true, that the vaccines we have right now are still going to do a great job at recognizing the variants we're all hearing about in the news. So those variants would need to accumulate a lot of mutations for the vaccines to not be able to recognize them anymore. And virologists do not believe that we've reached that point so far. And there have been lab results that came out, uh, again, last Thursday, I believe, showing that the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine does still neutralize one of the main variants in this B117 variant that's popping up all over the news. It's also called the UK variant. Um, so they've now shown that their vaccine does still recognize this main mutation, and Moderna data is coming soon, um, but it is well expected to recognize it as well. 
However, if the virus continues to spread through the population, again, it is possible that over a year or two years, it might accumulate enough mutations that we would need to update our vaccines to be able to fight it. And again, we're not at that point yet. Virologists don't believe we've hit that point yet, and we probably won't hit it for quite a while. But that is one of the nice things about RNA vaccines is that they're easy to update. If we do in the future need a slightly different vaccine and think, you know, for things like the flu vaccine, we have slightly different vaccines every year, um, we would be able to update it. And again, based on sort of the best estimates that I've seen, it might not be something where we would need a yearly vaccine like the flu vaccine, but if left unchecked, perhaps we would need a every two year vaccine or an every three year vaccine. So at the moment to sum all of that up, Yes, virologists believe that the vaccines that are out there will still recognize these variants, but in the future, we might need to update our vaccines to keep up with continuing mutations. Again, we've addressed this a little bit uh, in the presentation as well, but can you get COVID-19 from these vaccines? And the answer is no. These RNA vaccines only encode whoop, for just this one small spike protein in that vaccine they do not have the rest of the instructions to create the full virus and to replicate the whole genome. So you cannot get COVID-19 from these RNA vaccines. Uh, your body just doesn't have the instructions to make a full virus. Another question we got a lot of is, do these vaccines actually stop transmission? So the data we've seen so far from Moderna and Pfizer shows that these vaccines can stop you from uh, developing COVID-19 symptoms and from developing severe COVID-19 but do they actually stop the possibility of you transmitting it to another person? And the answer is that we don't know yet. So that data is still being collected. Uh, both uh, of these trials, as well as many other clinical trials for other types of vaccines are looking into this at the moment. So we don't know yet, which is again, one of the reasons why even if you get a vaccine, uh, experts are still recommending that you continue to social distance and wear masks to keep everybody else around you safe because it is, it is still possible that you could pick up the, vac uh, the virus and then transmit it to somebody else without actually getting sick yourself. And again, we're very, uh, I think we're all very hopeful that these vaccines will stop transmission. I'm certainly very hopeful that this data will come out very soon to be able to reassure us of this, but we just don't know that for sure right now. So the best practice is even if, after you get your vaccine, to continue both for your own safety and for the safety of other people to continue to wash your hands, wear a mask and social distance. Another question we got a lot of uh, is why these RNA vaccines require two shots. And the idea is that it's really, the second shot is like a booster shot for your immune system. Many of us who got childhood vaccines, you know, remember having to go back in and get a booster shot for some of them. Um, you know, I know I've gotten multiple tetanus booster shots over the years. And the idea is that it's allowing your immune system to see that uh, spike protein again, to really sort of ramp up that immune response. So your body creates antibodies against uh, the spike protein when you get the first injection, but then when you reintroduce your body it really sees this again and it creates even more antibodies and creates an even stronger immune response. So it boosts your immune system. So the second shot is really a booster shot, but it's still very important to get because the best data that we have right now shows that these two shots are effective or 95% effective against preventing COVID-19. And finally, again, I talked about this a little bit in the presentation, but a lot of people wanted to know why these vaccines need to be kept so cold. So again, the cold chain is a problem for delivering these vaccines to areas that may not have something like a minus 80 freezer or that might not be able to have a cold chain uh, in more remote areas. And the reason for that is because that RNA is really fragile. So RNAs in our environment and in our bodies can chop it up. So by keeping that vaccine at colder temperatures before it's delivered to you, it's reducing the chance that that RNA is going to be chopped up uh, by these RNAs. And also, again, uh, even water can sort of, uh, through hydrolysis, attack the backbone. So just keeping everything colder keeps that RNA more stable so that it can actually be uh, in its full uh full length and do its job when it actually is delivered to you in the vaccine. So keeping it cold is important for these vaccines. So with all of that said, uh, again, thank you to Ali and Sebastian and Bruce for answering so many questions in the chat. And thank you all for joining in in the chat. I have not been able to keep up with the discussion because there have been so many great questions coming in uh, that there's just everything happening um, all at once. So thank you to them for answering questions and thank you all for submitting questions. Um, 
One of the uh, other things I want to point out is that we have lots of resources around COVID-19 vaccines and specifically these RNA vaccines for teachers if you want to use them in your classroom, uh, all completely free and available at our website, uh, minipcr.com slash educational resources. So uh, again, the PowerPoint slides for this presentation and the recording will be there. The recording will also live on YouTube if you want to rewatch it. There's a, a question worksheet that you can go through with your students uh, that follows along with the webinar uh, to uh, sort of keep on track. And also just this morning, we released a DNA dot about this. So DNA dots are our explanations of genetic and biotechnology techniques. And so uh, Bruce, who's in the chat, wonderfully wrote this DNA dot about mRNA vaccines. So it's just about a two page PDF, uh, really describing the science behind them in a nice compact format. So it's really trying to break down all of the complicated science and make it really easy to understand. Uh, and so that is now also available on our website. We also have a number of additional upcoming webinars. So today uh, was our mRNA vaccine webinar. On February 8th, we're gonna have an introduction to fluorescence webinar, which is gonna be really fun using uh, our P51 uh, fluorescence viewers, which are great. Uh, then on March 8th, we're gonna have an introduction to our dog genetics lab, which I am super excited about. Um, I can't wait for that one. That's gonna be super fun. We have a new lab coming out about dog genetics. Uh, then on April 12th is going to be our GMO detection lab, uh, seeing if, you know, you can actually get GMO DNA out of a corn chip in your uh, kitchen, which is very fun. And then finally, on May 10th, we're going to have our detecting antibi antibiotic resistance in the environment lab. Uh, and again, all of the uh, resources for these are available on our website as well, so you can take a look at those. And again, I do want to reiterate for teachers that all of our curriculum is completely free for all of our labs across our website if you want to download it and look at it before any labs. Um, and we've tried to put together around COVID-19 and vaccines a number of different free resources that are available there on our website. So please go and check those out. Uh, we would love for you to use them in your classrooms. So. With all of that said, thank you all so much for joining me here today. This was a lot of information to get through. So again, we have additional resources to go with it. And this webinar has been recorded and so will live on our YouTube channel so that you can view it again there. But thank you so much for the exceptionally lively discussion that has been going on. This has been wonderful. Thank you for joining us. And I hope that we answered some of your questions around RNA vaccines, because these are a really new and exciting technology. And I hope we've been able to give you a little bit more information about them. So with that, thank you so much for your time. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. And yeah, thanks so much.